What we have in store for you today is a panel discussion on the future of fuel. Not just any fuel, biofuel. And for a definition of that, we'll be hearing from our panel of experts who I will be introducing soon. First, I'd like to frame the discussion a little bit, provide a little bit of background and history to you. It was two years ago this year that a young 30-year-old high-energy physicist on the Berkeley campus founded a laboratory. Ernest Orlando Lawrence brought together different disciplines, physicists with biologists, engineers, and mathematicians to tackle the great challenges of science and technology. This concept of team science has now proliferated and representatives of institutions connected to Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory are here today. 20 years ago, when it was first launched the Human Genome Project, this same cadre of individuals involved in, um, in team science got together and helped accelerate the progress of what was meant to be a 15-year project to decode the three billion letter um, human genome. With um, the founding of the Joint Genome Institute here in Walnut Creek in 1999, that progress accelerated and it was JGI that first completed their obligation to the Department of Energy who funded it and published their three chromosomes, about 11% of the human genome in the journal Nature back in 2004. Since then, JGI has reconfigured into the leading sequencer, characterizer of plants and microbes for energy and environment. Let me start by introducing our panelists today. From your right to our left, we have Jim Bristow. Jim is the deputy director for the Joint Genome Institute. Jim has a medical degree from Harvard he is a pediatric cardiologist who still practices at, the, at UC San Francisco, but his day job is running arguably the largest DNA sequencing operation for energy and environmental applications in the world at the Joint Genome Institute. To Jim's right, we have staff scientist Susanna Tringe. Susanna, um, actually has a degree from Harvard as well in physics and did her graduate work in biophysics at Stanford and then joined the laboratory of JGI director Eddie Rubin in 2003. And it's Susanna, along with her colleagues, responsible for perfecting a strategy known as metagenomics that you'll hear something about today. And that is, in effect, instead of sequencing just one organism, it's as if you went outside here and scooped up a teaspoon of soil and characterized the whole genetic complement of all the hundreds of organisms that live in that particular sample. And then characterize the metabolic activity, the enzymes and pathways that are uh, in that particular sample. To Susanna's right, we have Jay Kiesling. Jay is the Chief Executive Officer of the Joint Bioenergy Institute, or JBay, in Emeryville. JBay is one of three bioenergy research centers that the DOE launched about five years ago now with a sense of urgency to help deliver these biofuels, these next generation biofuels, to the marketplace. Jay is also Harvard bred, Harvard, Nebraska, that is, He's from the cow town of Harvard, Nebraska, and did his undergraduate work at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln in chemistry and biology before moving on to the University of Michigan where he uh, got a PhD in chemical engineering and then did uh, postdoctoral work at Stanford in biochemistry. Jay has founded uh, a synthetic biology center, a multi-institutional Synthetic Biology Center known as Sinberk, that's centered at uh, the Berkeley campus. In addition, he's founded a company called Amaris, which has ambitions to cure the world of malaria by 
engineering a natural product known as artemisinin. And more about that probably later. Um, based on this promise, Jay's laboratory in 2004 received a $42.5 million grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And probably in also in 2009 reached uh, probably the in uh, the bioenergy, the biotechnology industry organization recognized Jay as their first ever humanitarian award winner. But for those of you who subscribe to pop culture, his probably biggest distinction is his five minutes on the Colbert Report last year. So check it out on YouTube, it's very entertaining. So this discussion could not go forward if it weren't for a pilot. We needed a pilot to guide us further and that's where we have KTVU health and science editor, John Fowler, who didn't start out in journalism, though he now has, what, 35 years under his belt. Um, he studied at UC Santa Barbara, went to the Air Force Academy in Colorado, and um, started his own computer company before he was coaxed away from, from, um, from that industry. And if there's anybody who you want to ask the right question at the right time, it's John who will pilot the conversation. Uh, he is a pilot, by the way. He's got 3,000 hours at least, probably more than that by now, under his belt as a trainer. Um, the way we will proceed from this point forward, as uh, you are funding this research, this is all publicly funded research, and we hope at the end of this hour and a half, we hope that you feel as if you've gotten your money's worth. So about for the first 45 minutes, an hour, we'll have a conversation and then open it up to you for your questions and I hope you leave satisfied. So that we're on kind of the same page, uh, we're not gonna bludgeon you with PowerPoint slides, though we're gonna show a couple of key ones just to set the tone. But at first, what we're gonna do is show you a brief two minute animation that JGI put together with the Expression College for Digital Arts in Emeryville last year to define in two minutes or less, what is it that we do? So take it away. Led by the National Labs, the Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute partners with scientists around the world to decipher the DNA of plants and microbes to ensure our energy security and the health of our environment. DNA, the language of life, made up of a mere four chemical letters, this molecule appears billions of times in unique patterns to define every living thing on Earth. JGI's mission is to sequence DNA to determine the order of these letters, figure out what the genes actually do, and then freely distribute these data to the worldwide scientific community. There are many reasons to be interested in an organism's genetic code, or genome. One of the most pressing global issues is our reliance on a finite resource, fossil fuels, for our transportation needs. But extracting and burning petroleum has environmental consequences, such as releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We can do better. With the help of JGI's genome sequencing, enzymes produced by microbes inside the guts of cows, termites, and from many other sources in nature are leading to new advances in biofuel production. For this type of biofuel, we start with plants, nature's solar collectors, which store the sun's energy as cellulose. Even though cellulose is the most abundant organic molecule on Earth, it is challenging to break down. By understanding the DNA code of many different organisms, JGI is helping its partners to improve enzymes to more effectively convert that cellulose into an environmentally friendly biofuel for our vehicles one that would be on par with petroleum and fit into our existing fuel infrastructure. Advances in technology enable JGI to sequence genomes faster, cheaper, and more accurately than ever before. JGI then provides the scientific community with the DNA information they need to further develop their solutions to help shape a better future. JGI, sequencing the world of possibilities for energy and the environment. Jay, take it away. Okay, great, thanks, David. 
Well, uh, if we go to the next slide, you uh, obviously already know about uh, global warming and energy security. There are uh, two important reasons why we want to change the way we do energy, and particularly transportation fuels. Uh, transportation fuels put about 20 uh, or about 20 percent of the energy we use and put about 20 percent of the carbon into the atmosphere. So if we could replace a significant fraction of those, that would reduce the amount of, of carbon in the atmosphere and obviously slow global warming. Um, they are but one of the solutions we need to look into as we advance and, and produce new forms of energy. If we could go to the next slide. So the way we get our transportation fuels right now, and, and incidentally in the U.S. we burn about 225 gallons of transportation fuels in the form of billion. gas. Billion gallons, thank you, <laughs> billion, 225 billion gallons of transportation fuels in the form of gasoline, diesel fuel, and jet fuel. And all of this comes from petroleum in one form or the other. Uh, of course, much of that is pumped out of the ground, but that's in a form of, of hydrocarbons that we can't use directly. We have to refine it. So it goes through uh, refineries and they separate, break it down and separate it into fractions. Some of it turns out to be diesel fuel, some of it uh, gasoline and others jet fuel. And then we burn that in our uh, transportation infrastructure, in our cars. And that's what puts the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide that didn't exist there before. Next slide. Now, one of the ways that we've been trying to replace petroleum is through renewable fuels. Renewable fuels have the promise of not putting additional carbon in the atmosphere because we would start with a plant material. That plant is made through photosynthesis and in the process fixes carbon dioxide. So it takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That plant would give us some form of sugar, and we'll talk more about that sugar. That sugar would be turned into a fuel. Right now, that fuel is ethanol, but we're going to talk about replacing ethanol with advanced fuels. Then burned in your automobile, that puts the carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere. So this entire route could be carbon neutral if all of our fuels came from plants that take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Now, I want to talk just a little bit about sources of sugar. The source of sugar that we use the most in the U.S. right now is starch. So starch is a polymer of glucose sugar uh, that plants, in this case corn, make. And they sequester it in a very convenient form, that kernel of corn. If you think about that kernel of corn, when you take that yellow wrapping off of it, it's almost pure starch inside. And starch is very easy to break down and turn into sugar that then we can turn into fuels. But corn has a number of challenges. Next slide. And I want to just talk about some of those challenges. Uh, but just for your information and for full disclosure, as David said, I do come from Nebraska. I come from a corn farm in Nebraska. Um, and when we first got the J. Bay Grant, my father said to me, what are you trying to put us out of business? No, we're not trying to put anybody out of business. In fact, that's one of the other advantages of uh, renewable fuels is they can be homegrown fuels. But let's talk a little bit about why corn isn't ideal for uh, producing those fuels. Next slide. So, to make corn, to grow corn, you need a great deal of water and fertilizer. In fact, in the U.S., about a third of the energy that's used in agriculture is used to make the fertilizer that we fertilize corn with. That's 1% of the energy used in the U.S. is used to make fertilizer for corn. A huge amount of, of energy involved. We also use a great deal of water and, and other types of fertilizers besides nitrogen-based fertilizers for corn. So while yields have continued to go up from about 50 bushels an acre in the 1950s to well over 200 bushels an acre right now, it's still a very energy-intensive and nutrient-intensive crop. So we need to replace that with something that's more environmentally friendly for producing fuels. Now, 
the Department of Energy uh, a few years ago did an assessment and they said, you know, there's a great deal of sugar go, uh, lying around that goes unutilized in the form of cellulosic biomass. So cellulosic biomass is everything but the corn. Uh, the kernel of corn itself. It's the corn stalk. It could be trees. Trees contain about a third of their mass as cellulose. It could be tall grasses. Uh, it could also be paper waste. In fact, it's the primary component of this cotton shirt I'm wearing. So there's a great deal of cellulose. In fact, it's the most abundant chemical constituent on the planet. It's a polymer of sugar. But Getting access to that sugar is one of the most significant challenges we're facing right now in turning that biomass into biofuels. Now, as I said, the Department of Energy did an assessment of how much of that biomass we have that goes unutilized. And they found that we have about a billion tons every year that's just lying unutilized. It's things like corn stover, so everything but the kernel of corn. It's things like rice straw. In fact, in California, after we harvested <clears throat> rice, we used to burn the straw. And that put a lot of carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. We don't do that much in California, but we still do it in many parts of the world. And rice is the most significant food crop right now. But that rice straw goes unutilized. If we could take that straw and turn it into biofuels, we'd actually have a pretty significant source of biofuels. And what about... Uh, trees that have fallen in the forest. Those could be cleaned up, paper waste in landfills, and maybe we could, on marginal ground that wouldn't be used for planting food, plant grasses that wouldn't need much water or fertilizer. So there's a significant source of cellulose in the environment. Next slide. Now, just to put that into pers some perspective of how much fuel we might get from that biomass, in 2007, we used about 7.5 billion barrels of oil. Roughly two-thirds of that was imported, and a third of that was domestic production. Now, let's put that billion tons of biomass into perspective with this oil utilization. So if we just burn that biomass, just like if we just burned oil, we'd get about uh, the equivalent amount of energy from the imported oil we use. Now, just like oil, you can't use the biomass directly. You have to convert it to a fuel. So if you converted that to ethanol using technology that we think is just on the horizon, you'd get just about the domestic production of uh, oil. So that's the potential out there. We could replace roughly 30% of our energy that comes from petroleum with energy that comes from biomass. Now, uh, I want to talk just briefly about uh, the final step in the process. You're going to hear from Jim and Susanna a lot about converting this uh, biomass into sugars. Let's talk about the end product. So um, when uh, we take sugar and turn it into a fuel, we use yeast. Yeast produce ethanol, and this is a process that's been around for centuries. Humans have used this for producing beer and wine, and we've gotten pretty good at it. Uh, but ethanol wasn't designed as a fuel. Even though Henry Ford had envisioned it for the first Model T, it, it really isn't the ideal fuel for our existing transportation infrastructure. We have cars and trucks and airplanes that are all made, and the engines are all made around petroleum. And while we can add ethanol into gasoline as an oxygenate, um, it, it doesn't have all the properties that we really want of our hydrocarbon fuels. It's got about two-thirds of the energy density of gasoline. You have to go through an energy-intensive and expensive process for purifying it, because yeast only make ethanol to about 20%, the best yeast. Um, and then they die because it's toxic. In fact, we use it to sterilize. Um, so we have to get 80% water out of that ethanol before we can use it in our engines. Uh, it also can't be transported through the traditional pipelines that we use for transporting petroleum. It's corrosive, so it, it uh, will corrode those pipelines. 
So we transport it primarily through trucks and through trains. Um, and what's more, we can't use it in our diesel engines or in our jet planes. I like to say that ethanol is better for drinking than for driving. <laughs> so if you're going to replace ethanol, what would you want to replace it with? So why not replace it with something that's identical to the fuels that we're now putting in our automobiles, into our trucks, and into our jet engines? Why not replace those hydrocarbons with hydrocarbons that are made naturally through plants? So what we're doing right now is engineering microbes, yeast, to produce these hydrocarbons. The yeast secrete them. They float to the top. We skim them off. And because we can design the biology, we can make the exact fuel so that it doesn't have to go through an extensive refining process and a cracking process to get the fuel you want. We can design the biology to make the fuel that will fit within our transportation infrastructure. So we can make jet fuels and diesel fuels, not just replacements for gasoline. So we envision a future where we're going to have dedicated energy crops that will be very efficient in their water and energy use in terms of fertilizer that will make a biomass that's easy to separate and get the sugar out of it um, and microbes that turn that sugar into fuels that will fit within our transportation infrastructure. And we believe that these fuels can be carbon neutral, that is, that is add no additional carbon into the atmosphere. But they have to be economically viable if you're going to buy them. And uh, that is one of the primary challenges, and that's the reason that there's so much research going on in this area, is that we need to make these fuels that will fit within our infrastructure and be economically viable. We talked earlier. Uh, I'm John Fowler. I think you're, and I, my, my job is to, is to uh, ask questions, and I hope you'll allow me, indulge me just a little bit with that. You, you mentioned that uh, ethanol is not the perfect fuel, but yet today Brazil is running huge ethanol plants, running much of their uh, automobiles on ethanol. What's wrong with it? Well, so uh, Brazil has replaced much of their transportation infrastructure. Uh, they've replaced most of the automobiles now um, with flex fuel automobiles or automobiles that run uh, on 100 percent ethanol. Um, they're replacing their pipelines um, so it's a complete change in transportation infrastructure, and that only works for the passenger automobiles. Unless you have a gasoline-based truck, um, that's not going to replace that fuel. It's not going to replace jet fuel. So um, ethanol is, is fine for gasoline engines and the small cars, but it's really not going to cut it for trucks and, and for airplanes. Um, in the U.S., we have about $3 trillion worth of transportation infrastructure, be great if we didn't have to replace that. You know, we could replace all of that um, and keep the biology that nature gave us, or we could go with our mantra, which is replacing the biology to fit our transportation infrastructure. And this is using genetic engineering techniques that we've been using for decades for producing drugs. You mentioned that you are engineering uh, microbes and things to do that. Susanna, this is what you do. Yes. You were involved with the microbes. Mm -hmm. How do you fashion a microbe to make kerosene? How do, how do you do that? Well, I think that first we have to understand how they work out in nature. And in particular, we're interested in studying how you can take that biomass and make it into something like sugar that can then be converted into a lot of different molecules. And we know that out in nature, there are lots of organisms that can use biomass effectively as their primary source of energy. And so there are animals you know, that eat, eat grass or wood, and even just out in the forest, you know, plant material breaks down and goes away without any sort of intervention and without any sort of harsh treatments, that, the type that we use to break down biomass now. And so by studying those organisms and the genes and proteins that they encode, we can figure out how they're actually doing that. And then to synthesize something like a fuel, you have to get a little bit more creative because there aren't microbes out there making diesel for our use. You know, that's not a, a viable mode of existence for them. 
Um, but if you really study the biochemical pathways out there, you can figure out ways to, to direct the synthesis of those things, that there are chemical reactions that you know are carried out in nature that will eventually build those things. You just have to get them all put together in the right way to ultimately make the product that you want. Is it just taking a yeast or a bacteria or something else and turning it into the machine you want it to make? Mm -hmm. And uh, if so, uh, what happens if it gets out into nature? Most of these things are disabled so that they wouldn't get along very well out in nature, so that they're growing in the lab the way you want them to, but that if you stop nurturing them in the lab, they wouldn't grow for very long. But it is a, are you looking for the single organism, or do you think that it'd be best served to look for many? Um, usually you want to look for many because no one organism is already out there breaking down biomass and synthesizing fuel. Um, and in particular, in the case of biomass degradation, we know that it, it happens much better when there are many different organisms involved. And so, for example, in cows or termites that eat biomass, if you look in there, if you look at the, or those organisms themselves, if they don't have microbes in their, in their gut breaking down the biomass for them, they can't survive. They actually can't get enough nutrition out of that biomass to, to derive energy. And so the microbes in their gut, though, are a very complex community. And from what we've learned about their genomes, there are many different enzymes involved, and none of them, and they're, and they're not all in a single organism. There's no one organism that has all the enzymes needed to go from, from lignocellulosic biomass to sugar. It's really an exchange of, of information and, and metabolites that ultimately breaks it down into something that the animal can then use. How close are you to finding the ones you need? We've already found a, lots of enzymes in these communities, and we're de definitely, by studying more of them, we can learn which ones are really important. I mean, because you do, when you study one community that breaks down biomass, you'll find a vast array of enzymes, and it's hard to know which of those might be useful industrially. Um, and you can start screening them, but also if you look in a different environment and you find those same, same enzymes every single time, when you're, you know, if you're breaking down grass, whether it's in a cow's stomach or you're breaking it down in a compost situation or anywhere else, if you keep finding those same enzymes, that suggests to you this one is really important for breaking down this particular substance. And so you can learn more about it that way, and then you can just start testing them and screening them in the lab to find the ones that do what you want them to do. So once you find out the ones that do what you want them to do, you mm -hmm. tell Dr. Bristow, here are these mm -hmm. genes. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that information? Well, so I'm actually... Uh, more on the gene finding end, and would uh, Susanna would actually explore the sequences once we've once we've got genomes in hand, um, mm -hmm. and the primary focus of the JGI has been generating those those genomes that provide the infrastructure for first for the gene finders who would understand how organisms do what they do, uh, and then ultimately for the engineers uh, like Jay and his group that'll take pathways that may exist in one organism and move them into another organism. So the, our job at the JGI has really been to provide that genomic infrastructure to sequence organisms. We may sequence it for one reason, but everybody in the world has access to that information because we make it public uh, as, soon as, the, as soon as the data become available. And everybody is mining these databases for different reasons often than, than primary reason we may have sequenced it. But by having that information out in the public, it allows um, everybody to have a look at it and mine uh, these uh, microbial and plant and other, um, uh, other sequences for specific activities that they're interested in. Well, as we saw in the video, basically your information then is given to others to, to use. Uh, what, what have you come up with with those uh, genetic strings or the little snips or whatever you've got. Uh, wh wh what have you been able to create? So, well, the first thing I think to point out is just what a, that we are in the midst of an enormous revolution in terms of DNA sequencing. The capacity of, of JGI with a flat budget since I arrived in 2004 uh, has increased um, uh, over a thousand fold in the last three years. So uh, because the sequencing technologies themselves have, ch have changed, largely driven by uh, 
the desire to resequence the genome of humans over and over and over again. There's a never-ending supply of those. That's big business. Um, but that same technology we can use to looking in the biosphere uh, and sort of beginning to mine the huge diversity of, of life that exists on the planet. So I've, I've been out to JGI, and I, I had the opportunity to look at it from uh, the perspective of an outsider. They have lots of cool machines that are doing really amazing things. Can you describe what a sequencer does? What, how do you get the genes out of Sure. The I mean, one of, the, one of the wonderful things about DNA sequencing is that the, the technology uses, um, uses the sequencing or the, the biological processes that are normally happening in all our cells and in, in all life on the planet. So, our sequencing is, is sequencing by synthesis, whereby we take a strand of DNA, and because G always matches with C and A always matches with T, if you have the sequence of one strand, then you can just read the other strand by, by attaching the letters in order, because they will always pair up in that, in that way. And the, the technology companies that are developing new technologies basically every year still use that same enzymatic uh, machinery that was discovered uh, a long time ago and that was, uh, uh, has been parallelized so that previously we used to sequence things a hundred at a time, now we sequence them a billion at a time. Um, and that parallelization has increased throughput dramatically. So it allows us, we, so basically to sequence a genome what we do is get the DNA uh, hopefully from, uh, from a known source so that we can get more of it if we need it. Uh, sometimes of an individual organism, but sometimes, as Susanna will talk about in a little bit, from, from an environment where we have many organisms together. We take that DNA, we shred it up into pieces, and we'll sequence the, gene, the, se sequence the genome over and over and over again until uh, we've sequenced it maybe 100, 200, sometimes even 1,000 fold over. And then we use computational horsepower to put the pieces back together. Sort of like shredding up multiple copies of the New York Times and then trying to lay the pieces back together where you see the words, the words overlap. Because sequences uh, are mostly not repetitive in genomes, we can use computational horsepower to put the pieces back together. Mm. Uh, Susanna, that brings me to the next question exactly. Mm -hmm. On point. You said you, actually Jay said, you could take a little uh, cup of uh, soil and mm -hmm. uh, from that you can find the genes of, of the microbes that are in it and find out which ones do what? Yeah. That sounds mm -hmm. overwhelming. It, 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 it can be, but the reason we do it is that, um, is that most of those organisms that happen to be in that soil, like being right where they are, and if you bring them back to the lab and you try to cultivate them, you won't ever get those to grow, or most of them won't grow. And the things that you get to grow in the lab are sort of like weeds that will grow well in the particular conditions that you gave them. And so if you want to know what's actually going on in soil or in, you know, in the rumen of a cow or in your compost, then you need to find some other way of getting at it other than growing it in isolation and studying it and feeding it and seeing what it can do. Um, and one thing that you can do with almost any sample is get DNA out of it. We have DNA extraction procedures that can work on almost anything. And so once we have DNA, we know how to sequence it, and then suddenly we have this window into this diversity of life that we otherwise wouldn't really be able to access. And so, but just like Jim said, you know, you, you get it all in little pieces and you try to put it back together. And in some cases, you might have a whole genome of one of the organisms in there, or you might have just a little bit of it. But even on a tiny fragment of DNA, we can compare it to all the other DNA that we've sequenced, which is becoming a vast amount that's out there in databases, and look and see what it's most similar to and what kind of enzyme or protein it might encode. Uh, I asked you, just before we went on, is this a daunting, uh, uh, process to try to look at all this information, this astonishing amount of information, and try to find what's important in it. Is is that? Tell me, what's that? What's that like? I mean, you've got this universe of information, right? right. Well, there's a huge amount of information, but 
at least we have the information. You know, when I started my career 20 years ago, we didn't have, well, we didn't have the web. Uh, we didn't have all of this information served up over the web. And now with sequencing technologies, we've got this vast array of this playground in biology, really, um, that we can use as uh, a repertoire to build you know, a microbe, for instance, or, or retool a microbe to produce fuel. So um, yes, it is daunting when you look at the amount of information out there, but what we can do with it is so much more powerful than just a few years ago um, that it makes all of this possible. You also have to start looking in the right places. If you want a cellulase that acts in high salt or at low temperature, uh, you go to environments that mimic that, that are likely to be active in, the in, in, uh, in that sort of environment. So a cellulase is... Uh... Cellulase is an enzyme that breaks down cellulose into its simple sugars. Uh, we have found one of the re really remarkable things that we found once we started looking at environments was that you find cellulases just about everywhere. You go to Yellow Yellowstone Hot Springs, not the first place I would have looked for for cellulases, but they're there. And if you look at them, they're active, not surprisingly, at high temperatures. Uh, they'd have to be, otherwise uh, they've evolved specifically to be active at those temperatures. So by picking the environments that you're interested in, uh, uh, carefully, and you, have, you can begin to increase the chances of finding what you're actually looking for. And the real, the real chore becomes how to recognize it in this soup. And then how to take all those pieces and put them together into something that's industrially useful. So are we, you, <laughs> we're paying for it, but they're doing it. Uh, are, are you making nature, recreating nature? Is that the idea? No. So we're, 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 taking what nature's given us, let's say a yeast, and we're using the techniques that have been around for the last 35 years since genetic engineering was invented, um, actually here in the Bay Area. We're using those same techniques that we use to produce drugs um, and now using them to produce chemicals, chemicals that are, are fuels, um, chemicals that uh, will replace the other um, components that, uh, or other chemicals that we get from uh, oil, like uh, nylon and like paint and, and those kinds of things. So, uh, you could have organisms make nylons? That, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> very tiny ones. <laughs> no, I won't go there. <laughs> Uh, so, r really, what you're what you're doing is then you're you're fashioning then these microbes to do the work that nature does, uh, but better, faster, cheaper. Better, faster, cheaper. We're also getting them to do some things that nature wouldn't normally do. Nature doesn't naturally produce gasoline, for instance. It can you produces, make gasoline? We can make gasoline. We can make components in gasoline. We can make components in diesel fuel and components in jet fuel. Um, we can make small amounts of those. Um, the trick now is to make that at an industrial scale. And I said that we use 225 billion gallons of fuels. Uh, that's a lot. That's what's daunting, is how are we going to get to the point where we're replacing 30% of that or more? Um, that's going to take many years. And it's going to take many microbes, I take. Mm -hmm. uh, is it like with a big vat, like you see in the, in the uh, Beer uh, breweries, is that, is that the same idea? You mean for producing the for producing scale? Stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think you just need to, to do it in ever larger, uh, larger containers to be able to make more and more. I mean, I think you're not ever going to be able to, to make a lot of fuel with a small number of microbes. There are ethanol. There are some 200, I think, different ethanol producers in the United States right now. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not making all that much. Uh, we're using a small fraction of it in our gas right now as, uh, as an oxygenate. Uh, but uh, why hasn't that exploded, taken off? What's, what's held it back? Is there some roadblock? You know, I think, I think there's several roadblocks. Uh, one is, is kind of the way uh, politics works in, in this country. We, um, we don't allow ethanol in, to be imported into the U.S. without, uh, there's, there's yeah. taxed in a, in a big way. 
Um, and uh, we have a lot of government intervention in terms of uh, price supports uh, for the ethanol that we produce here. So the, the first problem is and that... for petroleum, though. We certainly really? do for petroleum. We certainly do for petroleum, but one of the problems is ethanol has never found its true price. We don't really know what that mm -hmm. is yet. Um, we're also using corn, which, as I said, is expensive to produce, both in terms of its energy and water. It's also a food crop. Um, and so there's concern over how much of, of that we really want to produce and how much corn we want to use. When you're using cellulose, this is material that, that humans in large part don't consume. They certainly don't metabolize. So um, it's, it's not a food source that we're using to produce this. Talking fuel. about switchgrass, uh, what else? What, what other things could we grow? that we wouldn't eat. So I think the concept is to use those things that grow in, in whatever region you happen to be. So in the south, it'll probably be uh, pine. In the Midwest, it'll be switchgrass in the, uh, grown on marginal land that farmers aren't using to grow, cor grow corn and soybean. In the Pacific Northwest and parts of California, it'll be poplar. Uh, uh, it'll be in part dependent on on uh, what farmers want to grow and on what, um, what will grow locally. Well, won't you have to have different organisms for different breakdowns? Poplar would probably break down differently than switchgrass or... Uh, yeah, and that is what we see. I mean, I think there'll be some commonality, but you would probably need some unique processing for each of those types. So I mean, right now, the organism, the, the enzymes that we use to break down cellulose into sugars um, commercially are all derived from a single organism, Trichoderma rhesii, that was uh, scraped off. That's, what's that? It's a fungus that was growing on tents of, uh, of American GIs in the Second World War. Uh, and it was of commercial interest because of the rapidity with which it could chew up uh, uh, tents. canvas tents, <laughs> uh, which are basically cellulose. Um, but that's where all the enzymes come from currently. There's a lot of diversity that has yet to be explored. And the crux is both finding them, figuring out which ones you want, and then turning them into industrial processes, because it's got to be compatible with what you know, the companies who are doing this uh, want to do. So there's a lot of partnerships that need to be fostered over the course of time to really make this work. What do you yet need to discover? What's, what's that? holy grail out there that you haven't found. What is it that you're looking for right now? I think the biggest hurdle is in extracting, is figuring out a way to release the sugars out of the plant cell wall. Plants have spent hundreds of millions of years learning how to resist that activity because they can't run away from their predators. So plants have evolved a cell wall that's quite recalcitrant to um, break down. Now, once a plant dies and it loses some of its defenses, that's a, that's a nut that nature has cracked, if you will. But um, because cellulose isn't just sitting in the plant wall by itself, it's covered with this gooey lignin, gooey uh, phenolic compound called lignin that excludes water and makes enzymes, uh, uh, makes it very recalcitrant to enzymatic bacteria. So it, it's tough to break down, but nature does it. Mm -hmm. and, but nature does it slowly uh, and incompletely. And what we'd like to do is figure out how we can uh, both understand and then ultimately deploy a number of those different strategies on feedstocks that we're interested in growing that provide the maximum biomass per unit of land to be able to get as much sugar so that Jay can give us jet fuel. How long before we have sugar jet fuel? Uh, actually, there are companies that are working on this right now. And as long as you don't need too much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. Short flights. Uh, so the idea would be you'd take really sugar that would be derived from plant material and then turn that sugar into basically the gasoline we put in our cars? That's right. That's right. In fact, uh, a year ago, we published a paper on engineering a microbe that produces a diesel fuel uh, from sugar. And it, uh, in the words of Stephen Colbert, poops it out, um, it floats to the top, and you skim it off and you can put it in your tank. Now, we made just tiny amounts of it. What would it take to scale that up to make 
say, to run the, uh, the freight liners that are out on the freeway? <laughs> it, it takes a lot of fuel. So uh, there's an estimate out there that in order to produce this 30% of uh, fuel replacement, we're going to need uh, 4,000 1 million gallon tanks. So 4 billion gallons of fermentation capacity in this country. Um, that's a lot of breweries. In fact, the whole country will smell like breweries. <laughs> uh, but so is it doable? Is that, is that something you can do? Or, or is this just pie in the sky sci-fi? You know, so we didn't get the amount of petroleum we have and petroleum fuels overnight. It's taken decades to get to where we are. Um, in many ways, it's been too easy. Um, we, sh we can't expect this overnight. We can't expect this to happen, to replace all of it in 10 years even. This is going to take decades, and that's why we have to start working now um, to get this done. But it's going it, to be a combination of things. It's going to be uh, advanced biofuels like we're talking about. It's going to be more fuel-efficient vehicles. We're already seeing those on the road now. They're, Boeing is making a more fuel-efficient airplane. Um, it's, it's going to be a combination of uh, electrified automobiles also that will reduce consumption. But I think together, um, all of those things, we can make a significant dent in the amount of petroleum we use. And how important is this? I mean, you know, we get along just fine. I, I pay a little bit more now at the pump, but I've got plenty of gas. I, I think it's really important. Um, I'm a little biased, but you know, you think about it. Um, uh, the planet warms up by a few degrees. We, use, we lose New York City and Miami and parts of San Francisco. Uh, that's pretty expensive. Uh, we send a lot of money over to an unstable part of the world, um, and then we have to go over there and protect it um, so that we can get the fuels we need um, and, and that we have to find weapons of mass destruction in order to justify being over there. Um, uh, we we uh, support, uh, we pay farmers not to plant right now um, so that we don't flood the market with food and uh, therefore put them all out of business. So it seems to me that maybe we could uh, give them a reasonable crop um, to plant, uh, an energy crop, that we wouldn't have to pay them not to plant. Um, so that would reduce our taxes. It seems like uh, we could be producing a fuel at home, maybe uh, creating a few jobs here, and we could reduce the amount of money that we're sending over and, and um, uh, reduce our imbalance in trade as well as keep money from an unstable part of the world. So it seems to me that it's pretty important to do. I'm going to keep paying my taxes. <laughs> hey, sounds like a good idea. Well, uh, also, John, sir. another important point is that it looks, it looks different than the current oil production process. You know, we pump it out of the ground in Alaska, we ship it down to Richmond, we have a big refinery in Richmond, if you live inland and you don't have oil locally, you're not participating really in that at all except trucking it around. The, the infrastructure to do cellulosic biofuels only works if it's widely distributed. You don't want to be trucking biomass, which has got a lot of water in it, any, any further than you have to. So the, the, there are obviously a number of models that are being developed around this, but the in general, you're going to want to grow the biomass close to a place where it's refined. There's an opera, the farmers love that concept because they can not only augment their incomes by growing, by using some marginal land already, they have, they have an additional source of jobs in their community for uh, production plants that could be producing cellulosic biofuels. And it, uh, by distributing it across the country, you remove a lot of the transportation the cost of transporting fuel and the around risks that we do yeah. that we incur now because it's coming from elsewhere in the world or from or from only a few parts of our country. So, so then, we're then looking at these various little plants that will be around the country, mm -hmm. each one tailored to what's grown nearby. Mm -hmm. uh, how reasonable is that? They will all be doing different things with different production cycles and different mm -hmm. chemistries. I think it'll be very 
I think overall it will be more similar than it is different. I mean, ultimately what you want to do is convert biomass to sugar and to fuel. And so I think that the exact cocktail that you use for that is, you know, might vary a bit, but I don't think you're going to need to fundamentally change the process. And then I think that, you know, we already have to deal with differences in crops and difference in, you know, the harvest seasons and whatever. And that I think will happen naturally as these come into use. So, but, you know, we have a history of this, right? I mean, uh, in the old days, you made wine or beer with what you had available to you. Um, so you made wine from uh, grapes if you were in Italy, and you made it from rice if you were in Japan, and... Uh, Wet socks if you're in prison. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, 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 Sorry. so human beings are adaptive. <laughs> and so we're, we're adapting to this new reality of running out of fossil fuels. And we need to adapt to this because we are going to run out of fossil fuels. We, we certainly are. We certainly are. In fact, uh, peak oil in the U.S., peak production of oil, happened in about 72. And so oil production in the U.S. has been declining. Um, in the world as a whole... We don't exactly know because, uh, you know, the, the reserves in, say, Saudi Arabia, that's a state secret and doesn't get out. But, you know, there's a thought that peak oil will occur somewhere um, in this decade. And, and then from then on, it'll be declining in terms of production. And that's at the same time that um, India and China are uh, growing uh, substantially as economies. And so... And, and the people there want the same lifestyle that we have here, cars and, and homes. Um, so there'll be a lot more energy consumption, and so more use of that energy. So we do have to find alternatives. So this is a technology we could develop here in the U.S. and export and literally sell them the way to help us all avoid global climate change and the oil catastrophe that's coming. That's right, and you know, I think Jim had a really important point, and that is that um, with biofuels, it's kind of unique. The jobs are going to stay here because, you know, we hear about solar panels being um, uh, built in China and um, wind generators being uh, built in China, but we're not going to have biofuels uh, uh, made substantially elsewhere and, and the biomass transported in, we're going to be making that primarily in the U.S. So, so it's distributed if yes, you use that job. Yeah. Yes, highly distributed. Uh, cool. Uh, I, anybody have any questions? One of the things that we'd like to do is in, involve y'all in this. <laughs> and and please, uh, please speak up. Got one over here on your right, John. On my right. Oh, thank you very much, David. Thank you for this talk. It's been very interesting. Um, you know, I've, I've been, in the little that I know about this, I've been very interested in the idea that we talked about at the beginning of choosing between, perhaps choosing between ethanol and other, other alternate forms of fuel, not that one or the other is the solution. And I think I thought that you made a, a, that choice sort of early in the pipeline, that you decided were you going to build, find a better source of ethanol, more environmentally friendly, et cetera, or were you going to find a way to make biodiesel? And now what I'm hearing, and that's sort of my question is, so is it not, where do you make that decision? Or is it, I'm sort of, am I hearing that you uh, figure out how to get sugars in the ethanol and then maybe that, or maybe the sugars can be uh, put through some other microbe to then produce a biodiesel or whatever else you're looking for. Is that right? Is, is all of the information you're gathering can kind of go different directions in the pipeline? Because I, 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 you know, that, that's, that would be uh, the best of all worlds because then, then you can make your decision. You take all the information and then you say, in this situation, ethanol might work. In this situation, jet fuel replacement, et cetera. So that's even more exciting than I thought. So I just want to know if that, is that what I'm understanding? So, so the key is once you get the sugar, you can ferment it into many different things. You could produce ethanol. If you want ethanol, you could produce uh, gasoline with some of these engineered microbes or diesel fuel or jet fuel. Um, so uh, as, as we were talking about, there'll be factories that are specific both for the feedstock but also for the product that you want to produce. Um, but the key here is getting a cheap source of sugar. I think there have been enormous advances in the last couple of years, much faster on the organism engineering side than, than on the um, than generating the sugars. 
generating those sugars has, has proved to be the really sticky wicket here. Mm -hmm. I think biodiesel that you mentioned has tried to sort of circumvent that by focusing on a couple of plants that actually already produce oils. But I think that, that there's a very limited supply of those and it would be really difficult to meet the supply needs with biodiesel. So you need to turn to something more broadly available like biomass, you know, cellulosic biomass. And this is a real jump. It's a jump from making just ethanol to making the final product that can actually run in our cars. Right. <laughs> Um, that's great. Oh, oh, we have a question over here. I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, uh, yes, sir. Uh, it's my understanding that typically in nature there's no such thing as a, a waste product. Everything is used, you know, further down the line. Um, the the scale at which you're talking about harvesting biomass and, and converting it into fuel, is there a danger in sort of the two circumstances that I that I heard where you uh, one example was like take the waste material in a forest and and convert it or or have farmers grow specific things in specific places that you'd be depleting those those areas to a point where you would then have to come up with a way of using energy and other chemicals to reinfuse those environments that would end up kind of costing the same that's as great question current systems mm -hmm. so so in fact there's a lot of work going on uh, with this idea of sustainability, because the fuels have to be sustainable. You're exactly right. We don't want to be adding a lot of fertilizers back. You know, one of the things we can do, because we really want just the carbon out of these plants and out of the microbes, is we can take the rest of the microbes that have been fermenting and making this fuel, and at the end of that, you spread them on the field as fertilizer. And in fact, there's research on this. And and some people might be concerned about uh, you know, a genetically engineered microbe, but there are ways to essentially kill these and they don't survive out in the wild anyway because they've been crippled um, to the extent that they won't survive. So they actually turn out to be great fertilizer. You're essentially just taking that yeast from the brew and spreading it on the field as fertilizer. Mm. And so you're replacing those, adding those nutrients back. The other thing that I think is important is the, the type of crop you choose. So when you, when you harvest uh, a corn plant, you take the stover, you take a lot of nutrients with it. You take a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus with it. Um, and those eventually have to be replaced in the soil. It turns out that there are some grasses. One of the grasses uh, that uh, we're working on is called miscanthus. And it, it has this interesting property that in the winter, before it dies down, it sends all the nutrients back into the soil. And so you can chop it off. And essentially what you're hauling off is carbon, which we need, which has got the, the, the cellulose in it to produce the fuels. Um, and so there have been cropping studies in Illinois. They've been growing it for the last 20 years. And there's very little difference whether you fertilize it or not. And what's more, you don't have to replant it every year like you do um, with corn. It sounds almost too good to be true, but it, it looks like a really great crop. We've got to do some engineering to make it even better, but uh, it's got a lot of potential. And, and to be clear, you are working on that part of it, on engineering the plants. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, there's, there's a couple of ways you can engineer a plant. You can either put genes that weren't into a plant uh, before into a plant to make it do something that it didn't do before. For example, you know, Roundup-ready uh, crops that Monsanto is more than happy to sell you. Um, uh, the alternative is, um, without actually engineering a plant, to simply speed up the process of, of selected breeding so that you get the, the, um, the traits that you're particularly interested in uh, identified and, uh, and magnified in crops that you want in a much faster way than we've been able to do. Jay, allu Jay alluded to the the increase in, sh in um, uh, starch content of corn. Well, that didn't happen overnight. The original corn, teosinte, you know, 5,000 years ago was virtually inedible. It distributed its seeds over the last 50 years, directed breeding, not genetic engineering, but just directed breeding, picking the, picking the traits that one wanted and crossing them back again, has produced this enormous uh, increase in uh, uh, in corn productivity. We haven't even begun 
to uh, try and engineer or to even selectively breed uh, um, plants for biomass uh, purposes, with the single exception probably a poplar to date. So there's a lot of there's a lot of headroom there, but we want to be able to do it as fast as we can, and that's where under having their genomes in hand allow us to identify the specific genes that are responsible for specific traits, and we can speed that process up. Great, thank you. Uh, is there another question over here? Where are we? Uh, over here on the right, John. Yes. Yeah, early on you um, alluded to getting this to be efficient and something that uh, we'd want to be viable as a, as a purchasing product. I'm just wondering about the cost. I, I know, you know, what biogas is produced, I guess, for about nine to $10,000 a million BTU, and natural gas prices are around four to six right now, depending on how far out you go. What is the equivalent energy cost for the fuels you're looking at, and is biogas one of the things you're looking at, too? So it's a great question, and, and you know, basically, you, you have the answer there. It's, it's what the competition is, right? So if we have oil that's $20 a barrel, there's no way that biofuels are going to compete with that. Um, they're going to compete around the $60 to $80 um, price range and, and up. Um, I don't think we're going to see uh, oil that's uh, south of $60 a barrel, um, maybe for a long time or ever. But, um, you know, I, I think the targets right now are around $3.50 a gallon for uh, uh, this renewable diesel. Um, it'll probably come in around $3.50 or $4, but um, it's got to be competitive, otherwise consumers aren't going to buy it. But, but there are other costs that can be saved, as, as you, you correctly pointed out. I mean, there are other hidden costs. That's right. There are hidden costs. Unfortunately, uh, the consumer doesn't see those costs. So we don't uh, uh, pass on uh, to the consumer the cost of protecting the Suez Canal um, so that the ships can get through with the oil tankers can get through. So, um, uh, you know, I think if we subsidized uh, biofuels to the same extent we subsidize petroleum-based fuels, um, there'd be no problem with, with uh, competing. Great. We have a question on this side over here. Uh, yes, sir. I'll get to you in a moment, sir. I... <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. I just had a question about uh, what do you anticipate as some of the uh, landmines in this intersection of energy policy and agricultural policy and water policy that the introduction of biofuels might create as <coughs> unintended consequences. I mean, could we, for example, could we be creating a situation where farmers divert from you know, perfectly good food crops to uh, biofuel crops uh, and therefore reduce the food supply, you know, domestically grown food supply or will we have farmers uh, deliberately growing food, uh, biofuel crops in order to maintain or um, get uh, uh, rice to water supply that they w ordinarily wouldn't be entitled to. So what can you anticipate as uh, some of those problems that, you know, we need to carefully think about uh, avoiding those problems or minimizing those problems as we, we introduce biofuels? I think a lot of it is, is going to be about incentives. Um, I think the right, we've learned, I think, a fair amount from the, um, from the corn ethanol debacle of a few years ago that growing a fuel crop, if you make growing a fuel crop more profitable than growing a food crop, uh, farmers will grow whatever they can make the most money off of. And we want to avoid that if we can. It's one of the reasons for trying to, trying to encourage uh, the growth of grasses on marginal land, because you, you really don't need to fertilize switchgrass or, or miscanthus. They'll grow on marginal land that you're not going to grow corn on. You don't have to fertilize. You don't have to, you don't have to um, provide them with a whole lot of water. I think water is actually the harder um, and ultimately more limiting resource. We've got enough land to grow 
enough food, uh, certainly for the U.S. population, to continue to be an exporter. Water, I think, is going to is going to be critical, and so engineering uh, engineering biomass crops that need the absolute minimum of water is going to be really essential, and that's going to mean trying to figure out drought resistance in uh, in lots of different plants, understanding how agave survives in the desert. Um, can you put can you put some of those mechanisms that allow agave to to hold on to water into other plants that make them more effective users of water. The miscanthus, for instance. Yeah. Well, miscanthus is a it, miscanthus is hard from the genetic engineering standpoint because it's a sterile plant that is propagated from cuttings, so it mm. produces the largest amounts of biomass. But as a substrate for engineering, it's really hard because we can't we can't at least the the miscanthus gigantus that you always see the pictures of is a sterile plant, so it's that one's going to be hard. Okay, it's someone's master's thesis. Yes, sir. I've uh, asked Garamendi and Sonia who are both on the uh, presentation uh, this question, and they sort of agree uh, with me, but uh, no progress so far. I'm a geek, so I'd like to ask a geek this question for good geeks. <laughs> Why don't, instead of you guys uh, spending my tax money, uh, why don't we tax gasoline, diesel, jet fuel to what it uh, costs in other developed countries, $9 a gallon uh, equivalent gasoline, uh, balance uh, our country's budget, and uh, uh, incentivize people uh, freely to use public transit to fill up those empty seats that's a political hot potato. It doesn't sound like a question for geeks to me. It like Ask the governor. <laughs> Gentleman in the front row. Oh, yes, sir. Hi, uh, I'm uh, from originally from uh, Jalisco, you were talking about agave. Mm -hmm. and I, want, I just want you to talk about agave as a crop or considered crop for, for biofuels or biomass. And maybe Jay can talk about hydrolysis, you know, taking, uh, making ethanol with hydrolysis, you know, versus uh, extracting alcohol from sugar. Can you explain that? Uh, well, maybe, so. We can start with the agave. Yeah, let's start with the agave. Yeah, so, you know, agave is, is grown in the desert for um, sugars extracted from it to make, uh, to make tequila. Um, I'm not sure that agave is necessarily going to be a, a biofuels crop, but as a, as a plant that, um, that thrives in very arid environments, I think we have a lot to learn from the mechanisms it uses to conserve, uh, to conserve um, uh, water. One of which is its mechanism of photosynthesis is, is a different one than most other than many other land plants use. So there, there are lots of tricks that agave must use to be able to survive in in such an arid environment. We'd like to know what those what those tricks are because we may be able to adapt them to other plants so that we can use less water, not just for biofuels crops, but but potentially for other crops as well. And in terms of producing ethanol in other ways, we do have other ways of, of doing that. Uh, but uh, biology has this great property of being able to do uh, a very high yield conversion of sugar to product, in this case ethanol, and do it in a relatively dirty environment. Um, you, you start with something pretty dirty like biomass and you get something that uh, is quite valuable out of it. So. Um, even though there are other methods, biology is pretty good at it. Um, another question. Yes, sir. Um, forgive me if I don't know much about the production of natural gas, but I'm wondering if anyone's looked into uh, engineering microbes that might boost the speed in production of natural gas, the speed at which it's produced and the amount. And also, are you, aren't you folks afraid of uh, microbe, a genetically engineered microbe escaping that might um, 
hybridize itself with other species and get a foothold in the environment? Anyway, thank you. So I'll take the first one of those. We've, um, we actually have an ongoing project with investigators at um, UC Davis to look at um, a bioreactor that's producing, uh, derived from a landfill sort of a microbial community to look at um, uh, the microbes that are specifically involved and the pathways involved in generating um, not natural gas per se, but uh, a syngas sort of uh, situation. So, and one can, one can do that experiment over and over and over again in different environments with different um, bioreactors and you'll sometimes see, I would expect, that you'll sometimes see the same organisms and sometimes different organisms but often the same pathways that get shared around between organisms. So one of the ways of identifying the, the pathways that you're really interested in is by looking at seeing those recurring themes when you look at similar environments that are doing the same thing. With respect to, to microbes escaping, it's something that um, microbiologists and genetic engineers have been worried about since the 1970s, and we, th we do think about it. From the standpoint of the engineered organisms that are going to be involved for fuel production, they're going to be contained in vats. They're by and large going to be modified in such a way um, that they can't live outside of that environment, and that's useful for not just to keep them from escaping, but you're also going to want to, you're going to, want to slim down the, the number of things that those organisms can do so that basically what they're doing is taking sugar in and making gasoline. And you don't want them have to, to have to do all the other things that that microorganism normally would have done in the wild because that's just taking carbon away and making them less efficient at doing what you want them to do. And by, by taking away those other activities, you basically cripple that organism so that it's, it's got to live in the rarefied atmosphere of your, of your biocontainer. Where it becomes a, a, a bigger issue is, um, uh, you'll see the ads for, uh, um, you know, Chevron's got a big activity in algae. Well, algae, and the nice thing about algae is they're taking natural sunlight and CO2 out of the air to make those sugars, if you could engineer those same microorganisms to go the next step and make a fuel in addition, you've got one-stop shopping with a single organism. The problem is that algae need pretty intense sunlight to grow optimally, and that means um, growing them by and large in open ponds. Well, there you've got a real problem because you've got an organism that's, that's living in the wild, it's got to be able to live in a pond somewhere, but you know, a seagull comes and lands in the pond and goes somewhere else, he's going to take that algae with him. So I think it depends a little bit on the circumstance, and I, I, it's one of the major hurdles that, um, that algal biofuels will have to face. Um, the first is that they're very hard organisms to engineer to start with. But even if you could, how you're going to grow them in a way that contains those organisms is, is, a, is going to be a real technical challenge. But it is something that... Um, everybody in this business thinks about um, and often the, it's a problem that solves itself when you've engineered the organism to really do what you want exclusively. Uh, you, sir, did you have a question? Yes. This is a little bit off uh, on a different tangent, but uh, I've been very impressed with all the uh, activity that we have here in the Bay Area in terms of biofuels research, JGI, um, JBay, EBI, and the companies, you know, LS9, Amaris, etc. Yet, biofuels is something that um, seems every state is going after a lot of different regions. Just, you know, from your knowledge of what's happening in research around the world, where does this region stand? in relationship to all these other regions, or just in terms of the amount of research, the quality of the research, who's most likely to get something that really works, et cetera. It's unparalleled here. I, I, I mean, if you think about it, we have uh, tremendous resources here in the Bay Area in terms of the JGI, JBay, EBI. Uh, we've attracted uh, about a, uh, over $100 million a year 
in, in funding for this research. That, and that's just kind of the, the base funding for, for basic research. And on top of that, we have a venture capital community here that is leading the green tech industry by creating companies in the Bay Area. Um, people like Vinod Kosla and, and John Doerr at uh, Kleiner. Um, you know, they're seeding companies based on the basic research that's being done here so that we can actually turn this into um, uh, real products for people. Um, so I think the Bay Area stands, you know, unparalleled uh, in this area. I'm biased. Uh, I, I have a question I want to get in before we go anywhere else. Uh, we mentioned something about uh, malaria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us how big a problem malaria is, it's the number one killer in the world, I understand, and what you can do about it. Right, so, uh, and why we're talking about it yes. here. So, so uh, my lab a few years ago engineered a microbe, a yeast, to produce an anti-malarial drug called artemisinin. It's currently produced from a plant, but it's too expensive for people in the developing world to afford, and about two million people die every year from malaria. Um, we engineered this yeast to produce this anti-malarial drug, and um, the, process, the research is all finished. It was funded by the Gates Foundation. Um, the process uh, is being scaled up now, and, and we're set to produce the drug. It will be out end of this year, early next year. It will reduce the cost uh, of the drug substantially um, so that we, we project we could save about a half a million children a year. Um, from this genetically engineered microbe that produces the drug. It turns out that this drug is, is a hydrocarbon. It's about the same density as diesel fuel and jet fuel. So if you've got an engineered bug that produces large quantities of this anti-malarial drug, you can make a few tweaks and you've got a microbe that produces a biofuel. Uh, we, we don't have malaria here, but we do have cars. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, question, yes, question actually over here on the oh, right. I beg your pardon. It, have you come across any organisms that can take heat instead of sunlight to convert uh, CO2 to, and water into starches? No. Yeah. <laughs> Not heat, yeah. But, but there are microbes that live in incredible environments, deep underground, that use uh, that, that can take the elements of the earth and, and use those uh, to obtain energy. So there are many other ways um, to obtain energy other than through sunlight, um, through some reaction that goes on. And, and these guys have been sequencing these interesting microbes um, from different environments. They may not be useful for producing fuels, but they're useful for other things like mining gold and, and doing other things important. But turning, turning heat into, um, into useful biological energy is a, is a mm -hmm. hard, I think, unsolved, unsolved problem by life, which is interesting mm -hmm. when you think about it. But you'd think some, some organism would have figured out how to do that. We, we have <laughs> time for one more question. <laughs> yes, sir. Could you give us more on status? What the recent progress is, milestones you've accomplished, and milestones you've got coming up. You're a unique source for us because you're on the inside track, exactly where we are. So, well, so um, we've got, uh, as I said, we've got uh, plants that we've started to engineer. They're in the greenhouse. Um, uh, they're many years away from uh, full scale production because. Uh, plants have a growing season. Research takes a long time because you can only do one experiment a growing season, basically. Um, unlike microbes, where every day a microbe grows up into a culture in a day, and so every day is a new experiment for us. Um, uh, we've got enzymes that, that have been found through the Joint Genome Institute that we're experimenting with in the laboratory. Some of these are now being tested at companies, so when we get something like this, we patent it and license it out to companies so that they can use it and commercialize it. So some of these interesting enzymes from different environments are now being uh, explored by companies, and these will be commercialized. 
Um, and, and there are microbes that are now built that produce biofuels, and these are being commercialized by companies in the Bay Area. Uh, we heard about Amaris and LS9. There are two companies uh, in the Bay Area that are producing uh, diesel fuel and jet fuel from sugars. So, um, you know, those kinds of, of products um, should be out in the next uh, two to five years in that range. Please give me, uh, join me in uh, thanking our panelists here tonight. <laughs> and we thank you for your avid attention and your feedback. In fact, when you came in this evening, I suspect most of you received a survey that we'd appreciate your feedback on and you could drop it off on the desk out front. If you don't have a pencil, it's out there. Uh, we hope to make this a series, and in fact, we've got the next date identified uh, to describe some of the exciting work that's being done at the Joint Genome Institute and with our partners. As you can see here, the next date, May 9th, it's Monday, unlike uh, the flyers, I think, say Tuesday, but the, the date is correct, Monday, May 9th, and we have three very uh, captivating speakers to talk about their research with respect to the mighty microbes on our planet and the roles mostly unseen that they play. So uh, also on that, on that uh, survey, we'd like to know how you heard about it tonight and how best to get the word out to you and how to join friends of JGI and friends of LBNL as well. So John, thank you very much. Jay, Susanna, Jim, uh, hope to see you back on May 9th. Thanks,